So very warm welcome to one and all over here. And again, on the third day, it is continuing to this today, third day. So we started with uh, the first day when we know about the our yoga tradition. And it is the third day of this uh, uh, seven day yoga journey where the secrets of yoga therapy we are discussing and seven day awareness program with Gita Nanda yoga tradition. And it has been a very important sessions every day and the time is being short. So we will be, uh, we have to gather a lot of things just to let all the people know who don't know about the Gita Nanda yoga tradition. And just to, to give a brief introduction that uh, you will know with the, all the teachings from the mentors who are presenting from the first day to the seventh day. So the yoga parampara of uh, Aisar at <clears throat> Ananda Ashram Pondicherry in the South India is the Rishi culture Ashtanga Yoga as synthesized by Yoga Maharshi Dr. Swami Gita Nanda Giriji. The rich Vedic Rishi concepts were received by Yoga Maharshi Dr. Swami Gita Nanda Giri from his Ashtanga Yoga Master, Sri Swami Kanakananda Ji, a Bengali saint. Swami Kanakananda was initiated and transformed from a mathematics professor to saint into a very rich yoga tradition by Swami Vividishananda Ji. Swami Vividishanand Ji had learned his, uh, the historic knowledge from his guru, Swami Purnananda. And the legacy is like that, and who was also a part of the long line of yoga gurus. The parampara contained knowledge of hundreds of asanas, pranayams, concentration practices, and deep meditative knowledge. And to bring the sum up, to make you aware of those traditions in just a seven day awareness program. So these are the secrets of the seven day awareness program that we will be learning in the upcoming day. So uh, in today's session, we will be uh, very blessed with the presence of our eminent speaker, our mentor, our beloved uh, Yoga Charini Sangeeta ma'am. So I welcome everyone. So we will start with the invocation with the Gayatri Mantra and Guru Gayatri Mantra. So uh, join with me. Gayatri Mantra all together. <clears throat> Om Bhur Bhuvah Swah Tat Savetur Varenyam Bhargo Devatsya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yonaha Pracho Guru Gayatri Om Tat Paramparyaya Vidmahe Jnana Lingeshwaraya Dhimahe Tanno Guru Prachodayati Om Om Yoga Maharshi Dr. Swami Gita Nandagiri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai so I welcome you all again on this third day of Secrets of Yoga Therapy, a seven-day awareness program with uh, Live Holistic Wellness and in the guidance of Gita Nanda Yoga Tradition. And I welcome our eminent speaker, our beloved ma'am, Dr. Sangeeta ma'am. So she will be sharing a very deep knowledge, the secrets of today's session. Uh, she will be revealing in a few moments. But before that, I would like to just give a brief introduction about her. So, ma'am, uh, with the, the quotations that uh, I would like to start with her quotations, that when people learn how to listen to themselves, they begin to live a better life and to improve the communities they live in. So, with this start, I would like to give a brief intro. Uh, see, uh, Yoga Chinese Sangeeta, ma'am, is the founder and CEO of Soul Sound Academy, Italy, a center for the study and research of contemplative practices for personal and social change. For unparalleled contributions in teaching, she was awarded with the Excellence in Teaching Award in 2020. And the documentary, you must all see that, you must watch The Girls Inside, which documents Dr. Sangeeta Ma'am's academic research on the use of contemplative practices for social change inside Cook County Jail in Chicago. That is a must watch for everyone. We will share the link in a while. And her spiritual and professional journey involved yoga, astrology, music, theater, and activities 
on many countries like Europe, uh, in, in continents, Europe, Asia, North America. And, and more than that, she is the senior mentor of Geetha Ananda Yoga Tradition. And we are very blessed to have you, ma'am, with us in the platform of Live Holistic Wellness. And uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Nilachal, sir. And thank you so much, um, Live Holistic. It's just been, uh, it's just been such a wonderful pleasure uh, to, to be invited to this uh, wonderful week of awareness. And um, it's a humbling honor to be selected among many, many, many mentors of the Gitananda tradition to uh, comment and share uh, the importance of pranayama in the tradition of Swami Gitananda Giri. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Live Holistic Wellness uh, for the invitation and Nilachal Sir, whom I have the real pleasure of interacting and uh, wonderful doing spiritual business with you, sir, <laughs> because uh, it's just been beautiful, such kindness um, in the exchanges, such deep respect for the tradition, for Sanatana Dharma, for all of the great teachings of uh, the yoga rishis. So thank you very, very much. It's just been a really wonderful experience. And my greatest uh, thanks and, of course, pranams to uh, Yogacharya Dr. Nanda Balayogi Pavanani, who's my yoga guru and acharya, and without whom this knowledge would not be shared today. Um, so I have learned yoga directly from Dr. Nanda. He's uh, my only yoga teacher. <laughs> so all of the all of the great information today is a gift of the Rishi culture paramparai and all of the mistakes are my own. So with that clarification, I also would like to say hello uh, and my greatest pronouns to all of these other wonderful presenters and uh, fellows in the yoga family of uh, Gitananda uh, Yoga. So, um, so the introduction was made and it has been made. And so for many of you, this will already be a known uh, information, but Yoga Maharishi, Dr. Swami Gitananda Giri Guru Maharaj here in the beautiful, this beautiful image uh, with Yogamani, Kailamamani, Yogacharini, Minakshi Devi, Bhavanani. Uh, for us in the yoga family of Swami Gitananda, known as Amaji, uh, with great respect and a certain level of familiarity, um, they are the ones who directly made a leap in the Gitananda tradition by codifying and putting into writing uh, the teachings of the lineage of the Brigo, as Nilachal sir has already mentioned. Uh, Amaji was uh, instrumental in um, typing a lot of the teacher teachings of Swami Gitananda that have been handed down now in books such as um, the book that I've you know, also quoted a lot today, which is, uh, I'll show you in a moment, it's a book on Pranayam as well as the yoga step-by-step, -step, which is a method. It's a yoga method. It's way much more than a method, but let's say that it's a method of learning uh, of the basics of the Gitananda yoga tradition lineage of the Sparampari for people who approach for the first time the study of this lineage. And today, Dr. Ananda has made yet another leap by bringing these teachings online. So for each generation, this information and deep practices have been maintained truly authentic and with deep respectful connections to the source of the paramparai of the lineage. At the same time, each generation has made sure that the teachings were contemporary and accessible. And I think that this is, um, per se, it's already a great gift of the Parampari. So um, what's really wonderful about this lineage too is that uh, Swami Nanda and now Dr. Sir, Dr. Nanda, I call him Dr. Nanda in a very familiar way, Dr. Nanda, uh, they are the lineage holders um, of the Bengali yoga and tantric tradition of Swami Kanakananda Brigu. And the teachings particularly of Pranayam are of this Dakshina Marga Tantra. And here we can see, you know, the lineage Amaji, Swamiji, Swami Kanakananda Bhigo Ji. 
And um, so what's really uh, wonderful is that both uh, Swami Gitananda and now Dr. Ananda Sir are medical doctors. They are allopathic doctors as well as yogis. And so the teachings are um, really placed into their cultural context. And they're also extrapolated out of the religious, spiritual, cultural context and brought in the context of medicine, modern medicine. And both Swami Gitananda and Dr. Ananda are doing um, a really meticulous job at translating the teachings uh, of the tantric lineage of Swami Kanakananda into a language that doctors around the world are able to understand. This is allowing Dr. Nanda and his team at CITER, at the Sri Balaji Vidyapet uh, deemed university in Pondicherry uh, to do very intensive research on the application of yoga therapy for the benefit of many, many people, uh, including um, children special, special need, the elders, um, as well as population uh, in transition, such as the trans youth of uh, the area and beyond. Uh, so the lineage, of course, has um, been doing this medical research since uh, Swami Gitananda studied medicine in Canada and then came back to the ashram. So uh, much, much, much can be found if you didn't know already, if you haven't followed this you know, teachings from the first day of this uh, wonderful week at um, ICYER, so ICYER.com, which, you know, uh, the links is everywhere on Milach and Sir's prom promotional materials, but uh, you can find there um, great information on all of the teachings that we're here sharing, as well as many, many articles on PubMed and other um, professional uh, platforms. Also, if you type both Ananda Ashram or CITER on the web, you will have access to a lot of the current research projects, protocols. And just what's really wonderful is that the team at Ananda Ashram as well as CITER is always eager to share their research in a complementary way so that the protocols that have been tested for several years now can be applied and um, shared in around the world. So the generosity, the great generosity of the Paramparai is what attracted me to it. And I was born and raised in Italy and I was living in New York City when I became aware of Ananda Ashram. And through a series of events, I decided to uh, take this leap of faith truly and travel to India and study with Dr. Nanda Amaji uh, and uh, Devasenamis um, and stayed at the ashram for two years. And it was there that I learned a lot of the practices that I'm sharing with you today. So what I'm sharing with you today is based on my experience of being an Italian, traveling to the ashram, learning about the cultural understanding and depth of these practices in the culture of origin and then making an effort to bring them back to Italy and the United States and understanding um, how to share them, how to share them in yoga studios, but more importantly, uh, in jails and prisons, as well as academia. So, so what pranayama is not? <laughs> Let's start with what it is not, given that we're gonna talk about what it is. It's not a set of breathing exercises devoid of cultural and spiritual meaning. So it's, it is, pranayama is based on breathing, but it's not just a set of exercises. It's not something we do once a week in a yoga class. And it's not something separate from yoga. So in this paramparai, we do not use the distinction of yoga and meditation, yoga and diabetes, yoga and pranayama, yoga and because yoga is a way of life, as Swami Gitananda has you know, taught us. It's a way of life, yoga is life. And so uh, separating yoga as something you do and then pranayama as something you do, it's truly a misunderstanding of these teachings. Um, so what is it then? As Yogacharini Minakshi Devi Bhavanani says, a tool par excellence in the yogi's 
aim to live a noble life of conscious evolution. A tool, so pranayama is a tool to live a noble life. And so we will see what that implies at the practical, mental, spiritual levels. And Swami Gitananda has codified over 120 pranayamas and they are divided into their effect. So they are correcting, cooling, warming, cleansing, awakening, relaxing, and all of that. So we'll see just a few of them today. And uh, so pranayama, right? So what is it? Prana is something that existed before life itself. We will find this um, prefix pra in the pranava om, for example. So pra is a Sanskrit, prana is Sanskrit. Um, and so pra, something that comes before. If something comes before the creation of the universe, it also means that everything that exists is filled with it. Because something that precedes the birth of something is there. It's a witnessing. It's a, a presence that is inside our tiniest cells, inside the atoms, all the way through the galaxies. So it's a life force is life. It's the life of life. These are all quotes from Swami Gitananda. The first manifestation of cosmic energy, the universal catalyst, universal creative power, the divine mother energy. Sometimes also Swami Gitananda refers to prana as the prana shakti. And so something that gives birth, something that glues everything else together. And uh, Swami Gitananda says that it's the science of controlling this vital prana, pranayama, pranayama is the science of controlling this vital prana. And eventually the attainment of a natural cessation of the breath in the Kevala Kumbhaka. So this, um, you know, the attainment of a natural cessation of the breath, Kevala Kumbala, Kumbhaka is a, a goal, let's say, but it's also something that we can't will, right? So it, it is a state of grace that is based on two important factors in the sadhana, which are abhyasa and vairagya. The abhyasa part, the effort, the self-effort, and Dr. Ananda often says that self-effort is the currency of the spiritual um, you know, path uh, and, and a realiza a realization. So self-effort is what we're going to be looking at today, right? Uh, some of the practices, how you do it, why you do it, which asana you sit in to do it, and all of that, the counts and all of that. Um, but then there's another aspect that is as important, which is the letting go of the mental, um, the mental control of pranayama. So there's both a, a desire to practice and then the letting go of that desire and just witnessing what happens when we let go of that desire. And so the Kevala Kumbhaka is a grace, truly, in my understanding, it's a state of grace, without which, uh, you know, the, the whole scope of pranayam is devoid of meaning. At the same time, uh, we can't practice with that desire in mind. We practice because breath is life. So why do I talk about breath? Pranayama is the key to physical, emotional, and mental control and the spiritual evolution through the practice of inhalation, retention, exhalation, as well as the ingestion of food and drink and skin absorption. So a lot of times we think of pranayama as uh, just breathing, only breathing. However, pranayama is also happening through our skin cells and in the food, and the drink we ingest, because it means the control of the prana, the highest possible absorption of the prana. So even though it's strange to think of slow chewing as pranayama, in a way it is. And I think having a more um, holistic understanding of pranayama is very, very helpful. Um, so also Swami Gitananda mentions that we must not confuse prana with any other elements taken through the breathing process. 
like oxygen, for example, or nitrogen or hydrogen, or the nutrients received through food and drink. Prana is none of these. We absorb the universal prana through the exposed nerve ends of the body, special nerve ends that are present within the nostrils as the inspired air passes over them and through similar nerve ends in the mouth and the back of the throat from food and drink. So even though prana does not correspond exactly to oxygen, nitrogen, food and drink, it is through these that we absorb this life force, this energy that is of a universal type. So what is essential? What is essential? One thing that is absolutely essential for the absorption of prana and its control is to slow down. This goes without saying, of course, but we need to learn how to breathe slowly or at least in a controlled fashion, chew slowly, sip our fluid slowly, this will help us to think slowly and vice versa. And at the level of yoga therapy or the health you know, benefits of pranayama, for example, is that when we think slowly, breathe slowly, chew slowly, sip slowly, our digestion increases, our blood circulation increases, our sympathetic nervous system, of course, supports healthy digestion, better, better rest, um, better sleep, and so we attain a level of non-pharmacological relaxation. The more we attain this homeostasis of the non-pharmacological relaxation, the more relaxed, of course, we are, the more we can slow down. And this is a, an incredibly wonderful, healthy tool that we have, uh, that we have ingrained in us. We don't have to buy anything. We don't have to have special yoga pants or a special yoga mat uh, or look in a particular way, right? All of us are truly blessed with this amazing gift of, uh, of this uh, potential health. So health uh, is a state, one of the definitions of health is that it's a state of psychosomatic, so from the psyche to the soma, to the body, homeostasis, a balance from psychic to organic, attained and maintained by somatopsychic processes, meaning that even though in the system, we'll, we'll look briefly in a few slides at the system of the Panchakosha and the teachings of Swami Gitananda on the Panchakosha are encouraging us to understand our experience of the world uh, coming from the Manomaya Kosha, so the body of the mind, which embraces within it the pranamaya kosha, the body of prana or energy and uh, physiology. And inside that, the sheet of the anatomical body. So this is actually how the psychosomatic balance homeostasis happens is by learning to control our chitta vritti, yoga ha, chitta vritti niroda ha, as, as we learn how to understand our mind and direct our mind, then our organic body and our physiological body also align. However, we know that controlling the mind by the mind is extremely difficult. It's very hard, <laughs> especially if your mind is like mine. It's constantly distracted, constantly agitated. And so these teachings help us through the opposite process of going from organic, so controlling the anatomical body, controlling and ordering the physiological body so that we can reach a state of calm, of nirodaha in our mental body. And uh, okay, so health and happiness are your birthright, said Swami Gitananda. They are our birthright. And how hard it is to read this, uh, or challenging, not hard, it's challenging to read this quote today. Some people would, wouldn't even believe it because today health and happiness almost feel like a privilege. They almost feel like something we have to put so much effort in. This is, this is true. For some reason, uh, the idea that a birthright is something that we don't put effort into is a bit misleading. Uh, Dr. Nanda often mentions that there are a lot of spiritual grabbers in the world today where they, because we're used to grabbing objects, 
products, grabbing pills, grabbing information. And so we think that our health should be something that we grab too. But self-effort is of extreme importance. And so we must always, always be mindful of our habits, uh, mental, emotional, and physical. So that's what the, the lineage is actually uh, blessed us with, a very detailed series of practices that help us take responsibility for our lives and live our lives in the most beneficial of ways for ourselves and others. So a disease on the other hand, which Swamiji also defines as Nara, and I've added here a fantastic uh, scintillating Saturday episode by Dr. Nanda on Nara. It's the state of disalignment or malalignment in this balance, in this balance. So we'll, um, uh, we'll now look at this slide of the nadis and chakras of the pranamaya kosha. So when we look at this, especially if you're coming from Italy, like me, you look at this and I didn't grow up understanding any of this. I thought my body was my physical body. I didn't pay any attention uh, to anything outside of my physical body growing up. And so this is where, when we share these practices outside of India and outside of the yoga um, uh, field or, or world or family, it is really important to be able to translate what we see here, which is uh, an extremely intricate um, connection uh, and network of vital air forces that are imperceptible to our senses, at least to the <clears throat> less refined senses, and definitely to the mentality of a Westerner who hasn't been, you know, uh, introduced to holistic traditions or uh, yoga, for example, that what we don't see doesn't exist, right? That if I can't see it, doesn't mean I don't, I, I can't, you know, test it, right? What we do with pranayama is that we are slowly taught when we practice pranayama, we are slowly taught how to refine our senses enough that we begin to perceive this very, very refined flows of pran inside of us, outside of us. And we are able to connect our physical, physiological flows, for example, the lymphatic flow, the blood flow, the air flow inside of our bodies, and our emotional uh, reactions, our emotional flows, how we are able to emote at will rather than becoming uh, enslaved to our emotions, particularly the negative ones. And so um, something that struck me today when I was thinking about, uh, you know, what, how is this today particularly meaningful is that this uh, quote is from about 40 years ago from uh, the yoga step-by-step. And uh, Swamiji wrote that, I firmly believe that this lack of proper oxygenation of the brain due to faulty breathing is one of the main underlying causes of the rising rate of mental disturbances in the world today. And so imagine this lack of proper oxygenation due to faulty breathing. Imagine how we are doing today as a whole, as a species, after COVID, not after COVID, through COVID, because some of us are still uh, clearly um, managing, managing COVID um, now. And, uh, you know, this faulty breathing will now go a little bit more into the practical of it, is that the faulty breathing um, is a common um, dilemma, it's a common problem. Like most people, and here again, outside of the yoga uh, traditions and practices, uh, when you observe people, uh, you will see that most people breathe through their mouths and through very shallow breathing. Um, it's com That's become common, that's what's common, that most people just breathe like that. So breathing through the mouth rather than through the nose uh, doesn't allow the nose hair to filter the air. And so we are more intoxicated by 
uh, pollutants in the air, especially when we live in cities. And um, so the first thing that we need to learn is to breathe through the nose. And um, it, it, I found a lot of resistance. For example, when I worked in this uh, jail in Chicago, there are some environments uh, where the air quality is so um, deploy, de depleted of fresh nutrients like oxygen that people prefer to breathe through their mouth because it is almost unbearable to breathe through your nose where your olfactory nerve begins and is so close. The olfactory nerve is the closest to the brain in relationship to the other uh, sensory nerves. And so we're really immediately perceiving in our animal brain if there is danger. And lack of oxygenation is always perceived as danger through our animal brain, by our animal brain. And so this creates a constant sympathetic response to a, an environment where oxy oxygen is not easily available. On top of that, you add lack of natural light, lack of proper uh, nutrition and all of that. So, uh, so one of the greatest, like just simply as that, one of the greatest benefits of understanding, learning and sharing pranayama is to encourage people to use their nose, <laughs> use their nose to breathe, use your nose to smell. Um, then the nose, of course, uh, and mouth passageways travel down into the rest of the respiratory system. And we come through the respiratory system in the lungs, of course. Now, breathing is the key, right? Uh, Nilachal sir gave this title, helped me give this title to this, this lecture because, or this presentation, because breathing is key. Breathing is key. We can go without food for about a month a little longer, depending on our health. We can go without water for about three days, again, depending on the context of the environment. Uh, we cannot go without air for more than three minutes. And that is if you have practiced pranayama before. <laughs> Otherwise, um, the panic that results from lack of air can um, bring uh, an even more precocious death. So of course, breathing is the key. Breathing is key because without breathing, we cannot survive. So the first thing is that, why, but why? Why is that important? The breathing center, right, in the, um, in the pons, in the medulla of the brain, connect with specific nerves that travel to the lungs and to the heart. Okay, so breathing is not just breathing. Breathing is what makes our heart stay healthy. Our heart without proper oxygenation through the breathing center and vice versa, it's a homeostatic relationship between the heart, the lungs, the inhalation and exhalation response. It's a symbiotic, it's a symbiotic environment. The heart will uh, perish, it will perish. It needs uh, constant oxygenation and so does our brain. The cells in our heart, the cells in the brain need oxygenation uh, constantly. If they lack oxygenation, you absolutely know that the brain or the heart without oxygen perish. So um, this is also from Swami Gitananda. So Swami Gitananda being a doctor uh, has provided a lot of medical instruction in his articles and books and so does Dr. Ananda. So if you may be wondering, why is this all about you know, the heart and the brain? It's because that's, those are the teachings of the Gitananda tradition. They are medical teachings as well as spiritual teachings because there's no separation between the medical and the spiritual, which is something I wanna mention later too. So for example, for example, okay, the heart. The heart is amazing. The heart is amazing. Uh, it doesn't stop pumping until we expire. So we develop a heartbeat in our mother's uterus. And when we die, we expire and the heartbeat ceases. So the heart at the spiritual level is also an extremely important organ because hridaya is the seat of our intellect. So when the Rishi 
uh, and the different, you know, uh, lineage holders uh, of millennia ago handed down the teachings, for example, of the chakras, of Anahata chakra. And in Anahata chakra, when we look at uh, some of the illustrations of Anahata chakra, uh, we see that there's a triangle inside the center of Anahata chakra. And in that triangle is uh, sometimes a lingam, sometimes a guru, and sometimes shibam, it depends on the traditions, but we will see that there is the heart of a heart, that there is a, uh, a seat inside the heart, which is the seat of our guru principle, the capacity for us to learn. Now, only later, maybe perhaps in the 50s, it was found out that the heart is covered with a network of neurological pathways that connect it directly to the brain. There's a direct connection between the heart and the brain. And so when we, for example, are bleeding profusely uh, due to a traumatic accident or something like that, uh, there's an immediate connection between the heart and the brain for the release of specific hormones that may keep us alive, like adrenaline, or in the opposite case, when we feel extremely well, oxytocin and other hormones. So in this connection is a straight connection from manas to hridaya. And so here we find that the spiritual teachings now are understood at the anatomical physiological level, which I think is just so beautiful. And Swami Gitananda always in this paramparai made us aware of the spiritual dimension of medicine and the medical dimension of spirituality, which I think is fantastic. So now we can go a little bit more into some of the practices of, uh, of the Gitananda tradition. So pranayama, pranayama, right? This work with how we can use our breath. We're just focusing here on the breath now. We're not going to mention diet, we're not going to mention liquids or food absorption in this particular presentation. We'll focus on what we can do uh, with a system that we already have, which is our respiratory system, in the process of controlling and absorbing prana. So some of the asana that we can use to practice are Vajrasana, this one, on your heels. Sukhasana with the cro legs gently crossed, Padmasana, we can see Dr. Ananda Sir here practicing, or Shavasana on your back. Whichever it is that you do, for example, if you can sit on a chair and that's all you can do, that's also fine. Modifications are fine, as long as you are able, either by yourself or through some support, to keep your torso erect. That's what matters. If you can't, then it's better you lay down in Shavasana, because we want to make sure that the diaphragmatic muscle just below the ribs is able to move freely. And then the intercostal muscles, which are the muscles in between the ribs, can also move freely. So it's better to either lay down or sit on a chair and have your torso straight, than try to perform something like Padmasana and then have your torso bent. Uh, the point for this particular work with pranayama is to sit up. So um, the first teaching of Swami Gitananda, and I'm going to cover just the basic teachings, which, by the way, the reason why I do that is because they can be your sadhana for a lifetime and perhaps another 500 lifetimes. <laughs> so uh, less is more, less is more. And truly in these practices that we'll look at now, um, we will find that there's everything is contained in them. Plus, if you are an educator, uh, a yoga teacher or someone, a scholar or someone who loves to share these teachings, the simpler practices are easier to translate. And I'll talk at the end, I'll mention uh, some opinions I have about secularism and how to make these practices secular in hospitals and jails later. But 
it is true that most of us not only only breathe through the mouth or only used to breathing through the mouth, but we can barely hold the breath in a controlled way for more than a couple of minutes. Okay, so starting with something super simple is affordable, is encouraging, and it's accessible to all, which is really, really important. Then we can build right on this. So sukha, pleasant, it's pleasant. So most of us are shallow breathers, says Swamiji, and today is even more so. And among the youth, among the youth, I find that this is particularly true, that younger um, humans, particularly teenagers, um, are completely unaware of their breathing. And the more we are on this machine, in time, they keep us in a um, position that contracts our lungs, contracts our diaphragm, and doesn't, in, doesn't really encourage us to breathe at all. Uh, a lot of the challenges that the youth is facing are derived uh, from their incapacity to breathe properly. So please share the information if you're not already sharing it. Help, let's help each other breathe. I think this is really uh, a call, a call. <laughs> so when we sit in Vajrasana, then the, the hands can be in a variety of different ways. The hands can be palmed down on the thighs. They can be folded in the lap. And then in the higher practices, they can be in a particular mudra. We'll talk about that. And that's it. We breathe deeply in and out, four by four, uh, on equal counts, equal counts. So I breathe in four, one, two, three, four. I breathe out four. At the beginning, this is enough. Then we can go six by six. Then we can go eight by eight. Then we can go 12 by 12. So we can always add. What's really important is to always use um, an even number, four, six, eight, not three or five. Why? Because even numbers are stimulants. They truly are stimulants. Even in music, the uneven numbers are always used to create a very uh, pitta-like energy. And here we are, our goal, okay, our goal, our hope <laughs> too, is to calm the nervous system, is to transition from the sympathetic into the parasympathetic uh, at will, at will, so that we can relax and gain more focus and ease. So even numbers, in and out, in and out. Now, if something like this is already a lot, right? Oh, you can um, suggest to yourself and the people around you or your um, students and all, uh, that well, this can be done while walking, for example. So you can put together the benefits of a brisk walk. So a little bit of cardio with a, a very simplified version of pranayama, which is I'm gonna breathe in for four steps. I'm gonna breathe out for four steps. Now this isn't valid for running. Uh, it isn't particularly good to strain the heart in slow breathing while the heart is pumping really fast uh, to run. So for running, this is not the case. But for walking, one could do that. Could you know walk in for four, walk out for you know breathing out and breathing in for four steps or six steps. What's also really important, and Swamiji always, always, always stresses this is that the inhale and the exhale are with the same air volume. So if I breathe in, in, I breathe out. So I try to squeeze out all of the air on the exhale and I try to inhale as much air as possible. So the counts will depend on your capacity, on your lung capacity. This is a question I had for Swamiji when I came, well, for Dr. Ananda, sir, when I came to the ashram, uh, which is um, that I couldn't breathe. And this I found also with people who are, uh, tr who have experienced trauma, for example, in hospitals or in jails, is that a lot of times when you, or people suffering from anxiety, like my young students, at the American universities, a lot of them are on medication because they experience panic attacks and uh, anxiety. It's, it's a very uh, rising number of the youth needing medication for anxiety in the United States at the college level. 
And so when we begin these practices, uh, a lot of people feel like they can't breathe, especially if you ask them to open and breathe. This is not at all, well, except some uh, particular uh, instances, this is, has more to do with the accessing the parasympathetic nervous system than it has to do with the capacity of your lungs to stretch or to, to open your alveoli, right, to stretch. Because in fact, if the lungs are properly hydrated, so actually magical, beautiful water, such a blessing on our planet, always goes hand in hand with pranayama. If we want to practice pranayama, we always need to have a little bit of water to sip. And so if there's uh, dehydration in the body, uh, it's more difficult to breathe. So if you're living in a city with a lot of thin particles in the air or you know, a lot of smog, make sure you're hydrating your lungs a lot because you have to do double the work or in very high dry environments like the high desert, etc. So, um, so I, have, I, I had this question for Dr. Nanda. I said, like, I can't breathe more than this. I can't do six counts. I was so like embarrassed almost. And he said, the more you relax, the better you will breathe. And so that, that kind of like was a real uh, awakening moment for me because I thought it had to do with something in my lungs, but the lungs and the heart are connected to the brain and vice versa. And so it is from the breathing center in the brain that we learn how to relax enough to breathe for longer counts. Okay, so if you stress out about breathing, that's counterproductive. So what happens if you start this? This is just a sukha pranayama. It's just the first step. And what happens if you feel like you're, you're running out of breath? You can calm down, let go of the numbers, just, just gather yourself for a little bit. You may walk and then sit down and try again. And you can make the counts a little faster. Some people ask, you have to follow the seconds like one, two, three, four. Yes, generally because of our heartbeat, we may want to do that. But it doesn't exactly matter. This is not so much about the quantity of the number. It's about the quality of the number. So I'm choosing four because in Yantra, the, the science of number and form and name, also another Dakshina Marga tradition that Swami Vitananda has handed down. Number four is stability. And so we start with four, not just because it's smaller than six, but four is a way to stabilize. And so it's great for a beginner's practice because it calms down the sympathetic nervous system. Because of course I could go one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, et cetera. And I could go breathe in one, two, three, four, five, six, out, two, three. And it, therefore they're the same length. So it's more about the quality of the number. Okay, so you decide how long you want that, that count to be. Okay, and then something that we'll see in a few minutes is the Vibhaga Pranayama, and therefore, let's go to it. Uh, we'll go to it right away, actually, because I'm, I'm watching the time. Um, it's the next slide, but the Sukha Purvaka, so we saw the Sukha Pranayama, now the Sukha Purvaka. Purvaka means a stage that must be completed before moving to more difficult controls, which will be the following breathing technique or practice, sorry, not technique, practice, called Vibhaga Pranayama. So we have just seen with the Sukha Purvaka that the Sukha Purvaka is the first of the four steps of the Purvaka Pranayama. So the Sukha Pranayama, pardon, is the first of the four steps of the Sukha Purvaka Pranayama. Simple in and out. Also called Gita Pranayama because uh, Lord Krishna teaches it to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And so sometimes Swami Gitananda refers to it as the Gita Pranayama. So breathing in, breathing out. Then we have uh, an opportunity to add a held in breath, a held out breath, and then breathing in, holding the breath in, breathing out, and holding the breath out. 
When we practice this at the ashram in the teacher training, the Sukha Pranayama and Sukha Purvaka Pranayama generally take us about a month of daily practice. Okay, so it's, it's just, um, and actually this can take a lifetime as a fan. So some of the effects, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Some of the effects um, is that when we breathe in, we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system because we're breathing in and so we're creating pressure in the body as when we are ready in our animal body to jump, to leap, to run, to hunt, right? You breathe in when you're ready to do something energetic. And so breathing in and holding the breath in activates your fight or flight, which can be used in very positive ways, right? So if you need to study, if you need to wake up, if you need to be alert, you can do a few rounds, six or a few more rounds of the Loma Pranayama, where you're holding in the breath. The opposite of the V Loma is you're breathing in, you're breathing out, and then you're holding out your breath. Now, when you hold out the breath, uh, you are just, first of all, first of all, you are fighting your fear of death because not being able to inhale again is a terrible fear for us. It's suffocation, truly. So holding in the breath, but particularly holding out the breath also begins to work on one of the enemies in quote, or the challenges of our yoga practice, which is abhinivesha klesha, our fear of death, our survival mechanism. So you see how many layers, right? We're conditioning the heart, we're conditioning the lungs, we're beginning to use the neurological, card uh, uh, cardiac, a pathway in a more uh, aware way. And we're also at the psychological organic level, we're also overcoming some deep, deep fears. So when you're having, when you have your breath held out, there's a sense of relaxation that ensues after you overcome the fear at first that could come from this practice. And then finally, the yoga pranayama is when you breathe in, you're holding, breathe out and hold out. And these are all for the same counts. And lastly, this is, a, <laughs> don't mind my face, please. But this is a slide from Dr. Ananda's presentation because of course, Dr. Ananda in his uh, YouTube channel, which is, you know, Yogacharya Dr. Ananda Balayogi Bhavanani. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, please do that as well as Citer because there's, so many, so many videos, uh, beautifully, beautifully done of these practices. So the last practice that, well, another practice we'll mention today is the Vibhaga Pranayama. The Vibhaga Pranayama is the next layer, the next level of teachings of Swami Gitananda, where we take the Sukha Purvaka Pranayama, and then we start to apply the teachings of the four layers, right? The in and out, in, hold in, out, etc. that we just saw to the different sections of the lungs because we have three uh, sections in our lungs. So we have the lower section of the lung, the middle section of the lung and the upper section of our lungs. And with the Vibhaga Pranayama, Swami Gitananda has codified a brilliant system to bring together the science of the control of the prana with the anatomical physiological configuration of the lungs. And then adding the Sparsha Mudra to feel the sections of the lungs front, side and back in the lower, middle and upper chest to teach us, to train us, to condition us through the nerve endings in our hands to feel these areas of the lungs that we do not, generally speaking, uh, know at all. We don't know how to feel them. We don't know how to care for them. We don't know how to inhale in them. And so we use the Sparsha Mudra as a tool that eventually we let go of, but we use the Sparsha Mudra to feel the inhale and the exhale in these different sections of the lungs. 
So we'll try this uh, at the end. I'm gonna, let's see, just maybe have just the lower section of the lungs. Um, and some of, I'm gonna uh, go a little bit faster on these, but so when we breathe through the lower section of the lungs, which is just under the floating rib, oh, sorry, over the floating ribs. So here, the ribs, right there here, and then they travel up and you find the sternum. So these are the, the floating ribs, the ribs that move, oh yeah, they called floating. So when we breathe and we focus and we feel this area of the lungs with Svasha Mudra, these are the benefits some of the benefits. Adham pranayama eases pelvic tension and poor lower circulation. And women in particular, because Swamiji uh, research showed that women are more shallow breathers in the lower section of the lungs. Corrects hemorrhoids, varicose veins, helps with fluid retention and lymph gland congestion. So these are some of the research uh, the Madhyam Pranayama or the middle chest. So the middle chest is right by the sternum to the sides. This is the front, the side, and the back. Enhances circulation in the liver and the intestine. So all the torso. So with the Adam Pranayama is the lower body. With Madhyam Pranayama is the middle body and the torso. It supplies blood to the heart muscles and it's great preventive Pranayama for heart disease, ischemia, cardiac insufficiency, deficiencies of blood, and so on. And then finally, the upper, Adhyam Pranayama, enhances the upper circulation of blood towards the brain. And as well, because it's um, the face, the throat, the face, uh, and all of our senses, all our, our organs of perception, uh, hearing, sight, health, stronger hair and skin tone. Uh, I'll give you some, um, oh my goodness, what time is it? I don't think, I don't think we're gonna be able to, to truly go into a, a deep discussion of this, but the pinnacle for me, for me, the pinnacle of all of these teachings brought together is how Swami Gitananda finally in this presentation, uh, then, brings the physical, physiological, medical dimension of the Vibhaga Pranayama with the spiritual teachings of the Pranava Om and assigns to each section of the lung in the Vibhaga Pranayama to a particular mantrika sound. So the Adham Pranayama, the lower breathing is Ah, the Madhyam Pranayama U, the Adhyam Pranayama M, mm, and the total breath when we're able to breathe in low, middle, high, sus suspend the breath and breathe out, that's the, that's the OM. Um, this is exactly where medicine, the highest research in medicine and the deepest spiritual teachings of this Paramparai come together. Uh, yes, we're definitely skipping this, but uh, so here's some research on practically how humming sounds, right? It's medical research, so we're not talking about the OM, we're just simply talking about humming sounds like um, so of course the OM, but here it's devoid of spiritual and cultural specification. Just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, stimulates the production of nitric oxide, melatonin, decreases the secretion of cortisol, just by the vibration in our brain and increases the production of serotonin and dopamine. Dr. Ananda at CITER has done research specifically with the pranava pranayama. So this pranayama where we add aum and deep listening included is in the pranava pranayama is the listening. It's not just making the sound. Um, has proven that there's a reduction in systolic pressure, reduction in heart rate, pulse pressure, and double product, reduction in rate pressure product, improvement of skeletal muscle functions in those who had suffered from heart attacks and ischemia and uh, um, embolisms improved cognitive functions because there's research also that proves that singing uh, helps 
people with Alzheimer's, for example, conditions to regain a sense of sociability that they have lost in language, improved behavioral function and restored autonomic balance of nervous system. So we breathing in, it's the sympathetic stimulation, breathing out the parasympathetic stimulation and there's this autonomic balance. Um, and enhanced sinus arrhythmia. So on the CITER website, as well as the ICWIRE website, uh, there is the database of articles uh, that are available. Also PubMed or Academia, if you go on and digit Dr. Ananda Balayogi Bhavanani's name, a lot of this research is available there. And then lastly, I wanna finish with this because it's time. Uh, this is another quote by Yoga uh, Maharishi, Dr. Swami Gitanama Giri. Our rishi Stotta Prana is the cosmic glue which holds together the five bodies of men, the Pancha Kosha. So on another layer, even more, yet another layer, we have this application of the Pranava Pranayama to a possible interpretation of the Kosha. The Kosha and the relative Klesha, Pancha Kosha, Pancha Klesha, where the abhinivesha, the survival mechanism, our fear of the physical body to die, the annamaya kosha, can be um, eased with the akara. The pranamaya kosha, which is the um, raga dvesha, attraction, repulsion, can be eased with the ukara. And avidya and asmita, ignorance and attachment to the ego, which is born in our minds, with the mkara. And the rising of the sound of ah, the guttural, ah, ooh, which is palatal, and mm, which is in the mask, it's uh, nasal and labial, and then the mm, which is a retroflex cerebral that is signified by the Chandra Bindu of the Om that bring the sound all the way up to the top of the head, allow us to bring this energy up, right? Bring, transform uh, our Klesha habits and bring the sound up and bring the vibration up uh, of the voice from the throat up, 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 and all the way up to the top of the head towards the Vijnana Maya Kosha and the Ananda Maya Kosha, which are of course not afflicted by the Klesha. So anyways, thank you so much. I think, I think we are at about time, so I don't wanna overdo it. Uh, so um, thank you. Anila I don't know if there are any questions or if we have to stop immediately. I, I'm not sure if I'm already over time. I don't know what happened. <laughs> are we good? Yes, but they're good. And actually, the participants also would like to know more about the pranayama and they, and they want you to go and on and whatever you are just explaining. So there are some few questions and with the questions, we can uh, make them understand what these are. So there are some questions that what are sparsh mudra? If we can explain that in a brief. Yes, sir. Sure. Or oh, let me interrupt. Uh, con okay. Uh, what is sparsh mudra? So sparsh is Dutch. Oh, Dr. Sir is here. Namaskaram, sir. <laughs> I said at the beginning that all of the good information from this presentation is yours and all of the mistakes are mine. <laughs> so, so just to clarify, uh, sparsh means touch. So a sparsh mudra is uh, the capacity to use the nerve reflex uh, in our hands to communicate directly with a place in our body that may not have the same sensitivity of our hand. So for example, the hand and feet, which are used for reflexology by nature are more receptive. It's very, very uh, uh, beautiful sensation we have right out the soles of our feet and hands. Um, but for example, a section of the lungs may not feel that sensitive for us, particularly the back where we have strong back muscles. And so we use the Sparsh Mudra to become aware of which area of the lungs we are connecting with so that after a while, when we take the sparsh mudra off, so we take our hands off, we are the pathway from our brain and our heart to the lungs has already been established. It's a, a level of neuroplasticity in a way that it's already been established. And so 
immediately, and this happens, it's so fun and miraculous actually, that you can think lower back section of the lungs and that area will expand right away. But it takes sometimes, it takes, you know, uh, some practice and that's why Swamiji has been generous to give us this tool, it's a tool. So at some point, the idea is to let it go and sit with different mudras. So the jnana mudra, the adi mudra, and all other mudras that are used for pranava pranayama later. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are some few more questions here that I would like to uh, share with you. There are two of them are pranayama. If you can just demonstrate one uh, round of pranayama, if you can do, then uh, they, they just want to have a demonstration now, if it yes. is possible. Yes, absolutely, of course. Uh, so um, I didn't hear your first part of the question. Is there one of the three that is more uh, interesting or shall we just do the Sukha Purvaka or, or is, are people more interested? Because the Vibhaga is a, a six week practice. <laughs> so I don't think we have six weeks, sir. <laughs> but, uh, but we could do uh, perhaps the Sukha Purvaka with the, uh, the uh, held out, maybe, uh, so that we can relax. Is that would that Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's do, um, let's practice uh, six rounds. Let's practice, let's do this actually. Let's practice six rounds of uh, Sukha Pranayama, just breathing in and breathing out simply. We'll do six rounds of this. And then we'll do just the Adam Pranayama only with the front of the lungs in the uh, lower breathing. So we can, we can practice that. And then we'll see what we, how we do with time. Okay, so let's remember that the upper torso is aligned. So sometimes people say that the upper torso is straight. An upper torso cannot be straight. Okay, so the upper torso can be aligned. So imagine that you're being held by a thread, perhaps like a, like a little marionette, so that you align and elongate the body rather than keeping it straight. So we elongate and we make sure that the head is gently turning to the right and to the left. And then we observe, we relax our eyes, the nostrils, the tongue, the lips. Relax your shoulders, roll them down and back. And <clears throat> when we practice pranayama, generally pranayama is the fourth limb of Ashtanga Yoga that integrates the teaching of yam, niyam, and asana. That implies that pranayama is best practice if our body has been already uh, um, stimulated through asana, right? So generally speaking, we are warmed up, let's say. But in this case, let's just make sure that we're relaxed enough. And then for a beginner, I would say, let's put our hands on our chest and relax your shoulders. And from here, we're gonna breathe in six and breathe out six and try to expand all of your lungs at the same time, if you can, forward, side and back and the bottom to the top. Breathe out to prepare through your nose. Breathe in through the nose, one, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. And one more inhale. And exhale. And then observe, relax your hands and just observe the quality of your mind, the 
quality of your emotions and how you're feeling physically, physiologically. Just observe. Very good. After a while, the space between thoughts will elongate. So the length of your breaths and the length of the space between thoughts will coincide. So the shallower the breath, the more agitated and speedy the citta vritti. The lengthier the breath, the lengthier the calm between breaths. And that's really super. Now, we can continue and bring the Sparsha Mudra now as it is truly intended, which is on the lower section of your lungs. So find the floating ribs by touching your body without shame or fear and find the floating ribs. You can follow the ribs, you can feel them, it's a bony, it's bones, up to the sternum. So if you don't know where it is, go backwards from the sternum let your body become comfortable with your body and guiding people touching their body in this beautiful spiritual way. And then the hands are relaxed, the shoulders are relaxed, the thumbs are together, fingers relaxed. The thumbs are together so that the energy is all contained into the hand and doesn't create a 90 degree angle, which could be disruptive for energy flow. So keep it together and put them right here on the lungs, relaxing. Some people have a hard time finding them, and then, if you can't find them, try to cough. <coughs> and you'll feel your diaphragm. Right above the diaphragm are the floating ribs. That's another way. Good. Do not squeeze anything. Do not pressure anything. Do not, not too fluffy. It's the right tones. All right. From here, we're going to try to move our hands forward, not up. Forward as I inhale. They come forward and slightly to the side. Exhale, just like that, okay? Breathe out to begin. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Three more times in. Out. In. <clears throat> Out. In. And. Flex your hand, you may roll your hands at the wrist. And um, Dinacha, sir, could I uh, continue on or should we interrupt? I don't know about time. Uh, yes, ma'am, we can continue, ma'am. Ah, okay, so we'll continue through the whole uh, uh, Adhyam Brahmanyama then. So now we're going to move to the sides. So from the front, move horizontally to the side. Right there, right there. Now, if you have paining in your shoulders and all that, you can relax, you shouldn't hurt. So that's a little bit more difficult. If you have an instructor, they can help you feel or a loved one who can help you, they can put their hands there, that's okay too. Otherwise, if you're able to, you can put your hands here. We're gonna do the same thing for six rounds. Generally, it's nine rounds, it's better, but for time, We'll do six. Breathe out to prepare. Inhale. Exhale. 
Inhale. Exhale. This is a fairly fast six by six. You can always slow down when you practice by yourself. Inhale. Exhale. In. Out. In. Out. And the last one in. And out. Relax your hands, you can roll them a bit. Especially if you're not used to holding the wrists and the fingers in this position, it's very good to roll them between rounds. A uh, uh, question often asked is, uh, do the hands go down, do the hands go back, or the hands stay towards the front because the lungs open in this way, like a bellow, and so you wanna keep them in this way. Now for the back side of the lungs, um, we put them in this way, so, so here, you can follow it back. So from here, you just turn back and try to follow the ribs. The ribs will change. They're no longer floating because they're, of course, fused to the vertebral column. So they are not as movable. So we will feel it less. But nevertheless, keep your thumb together if you can. Breathe out to prepare. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Breathing out. In. Out. In. Out. Very gently release your hands, relax your shoulder, check your body, make sure you're uh, releasing any possible tension that comes from the, from the mudra, from the sparsh mudra. And <clears throat> now this practice of going uh, subsection to subsection takes a few days, a few, few, few days. So we can practice these. Then we'll go to the middle side and back, then to the upper side, which is right under the armpits. And for the back, we would put our hands here. So again, I would refer you to the videos that Dr. Nanda Saiter has on the YouTube channel for proper instruction when you want to follow that. Um, but because we have done this, the last thing we can try, because it's exciting, is to try to follow the breath now from the front to the side to the back. So we're gonna breathe in one, two, three, four, five, six, exhaling from the back. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's like a bellow. We breathe in front, side, back. And when we exhale, we go from back, side, front. So let's try that, just, uh, just, just to try. Breathe out to prepare. You can keep your eyes open if you want to observe the mudra. Make sure they are where you are putting them as well. Sorry, breathe out to prepare now. Inhale, front, two. Side, two. Back, two. Exhale, back. Side, front. Inhale, front. Side, back. Exhale, back, side, front. 
one more time in. Slide. And back. And out back. Side. Front. Release your hands and try without the hands. Inhale, front. Side. Back. Exhale, back. Side. Front. Squeeze the air out. In. Front. Side. And back. And exhale. Side. Back. Side. Squeeze that bellow out. Front. Last one. In. Front. Side. Back. Exhale. Back. Side. Front. And relax. Observe. Witness yourself. that you are feeling your bronchioli and alveoli dance with joy, probably. <laughs> All right, so the last one, as we are uh, using time, I think, again, we'll try to um, add the akara, because it's so beautiful to add the sound of the voice to this practice. Uh, again, with due respect to these practices that take months, to improve so now we're a little bit rushing through not out of lack of respect but just to just to make us feel uh, what is the potential of this practice okay so deep respect for the time that it actually takes okay. so what we're going to do is that we're going to breathe in you can use your hands or if you feel confident and comfortable you can just don't use the hands breathing in one two side and back and then on the exhale when we add a sound to the exhale, our exhale capacity becomes three times, four times bigger. That's the beauty of chanting, of invoking this mantrikas as well. So we're going to inhale six and exhale 12. Okay, so we're going to go uh, one by two. And you'll find that you'll probably have more air, but just, just for practice. Okay, so exhale to begin. Uh, akara for lower, lower lungs. Inhale one, side, back, ah, ah, side, ah. Inhale one, front, side, and back, ah, Side hug. Front hug. Let's try the third one without the hands. Breathing in. Uh. So lastly, when we are able to practice these and we add the front side and back of ooh, middle and the front side and back of mm, upper clavicular, we create a spiraling effect because we go forward, a front, side, back, middle front, side, back, upper front, side, back. And the last sound, Last sound, the Anuswara, the Chandra Bindu, uh, gives into a suspension, a very gentle suspension before we exit, uh, exit sorry, we uh, chant the pranava. And so 
because we haven't practiced, I'm not going to really necessarily invite you to, but I'm also going to invite you to do it with me. There's some members of the Gitananda family here, so uh, we can, uh, I will practice it once so that at least you can, uh, you can hear it. And I'll do it with the hand so you can see it as well. So after exhaling, breathing in, I go into middle, I go into upper, I suspend lightly, and then I go from lower back in the back. And so this full breath is at the same time extremely potent at the medical, clinical, therapeutic level and extremely potent at the spiritual level. And this is where I would like to perhaps conclude that the teachings of the Gitananda Paramparai uh, are handed down and shared with very high respect of the culture of origin and of their spiritual power. And they're never devoid of these two because the power of these practices resides in the connection, in this glue that prana has, that creates with all the pancha kosha like Swamiji has instructed us. And so cutting out in the name of secularism, how these practices connect us to the high teachings of the Ananda Maya Kosha and the Jnana Maya Kosha doesn't serve the practices at all and doesn't serve the practitioners either. And so with that in mind and heart, I would like to thank you all so much for your patience and for sticking till the end. My deepest gratitude to uh, my guru, uh, Dr. Ananda Balayogi Bhavanani, whose teachings I shared, they're all coming from him. <laughs> so thank you for being here, sir. And then Milachal and the team at um, this wonderful organization. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I am very, very happy to be a bridge uh, to these teachings. Uh, Dr. Nanda is here and he's always very responsive. However, often very, very busy. And so if I can support in any way to be, you know, uh, giving you any indication or send you to the YouTube links or anything like that, don't hesitate to contact me via Facebook or Instagram and all. And I'll be happy to direct you eventually to Dr. Nanda. All the rivers flow into Dr. Nanda's ocean at the end. So <laughs> I'm just going to direct you to the right place. <laughs> so thank you all so, so much. Um, yes, thank to you, you. Nila Chalser. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is really an amazing session that we discussed in the yoga step-by-step -step, uh, course. So really, thank you so much. And as we all see uh, that the simple one pranayam that we discussed and the ma'am demonstrated very well. And there are 120 pranayam in this tradition. So how <laughs> wonderful it will be if we learn all these pranayam. So, uh, so we have shared only uh, the glimpse of the secret of this pranayam that ma'am shared with us and the time is really very limited and for these practices also you need months and months to conquer the uh, ability. So thank you so much ma'am and uh, we have with us uh, uh, Ananda sir without his words uh, we can't just go further. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste, Namaskar, and uh, nice to see all of you. Uh, very beautiful presentation uh, by Sangeeta that has given a very beautiful panoramic view of uh, pranayama. And uh, it, is, it is a topic that you could go on for 120 sessions at least. So there's such depth there. But you have covered very beautifully, and uh, I think Every participant has a lot of food for thought. The most important thing we need to understand here is that we are connecting to the prana through whatever we are doing. So the whole process is of connecting 
or rather reconnecting. So it is like I was thinking, you know, because I had a phone call in between. And so I put Sangeeta on mute so that, you know, I could talk to the other person and I was also on mute. And suddenly it struck me that, you know, all the time the prana is trying to connect to us. The vibration is there, the nada is there, but we have put it on mute. <laughs> and then we say there's no vibration, there's no prana, there's nothing because we have put it on mute. Prana has not muted itself. We have muted our connectivity to the prana. So unmuting our connectivity to prana is what we are doing in all of these pranayamas. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful explanation she gave of the Sparsha Mudra. Because the sensitivity on the palmer surface is so amazing compared to say your torso. And in medicine, there is something called two-point discrimination, where if I take two pins and I poke you, okay, we love to do this. So if I poke <laughs> you on your torso, the pins will be this far apart and you think it is one pin. Because your ability to know that it is, you know, the sensitivity is not there in the torso. But in your fingers, even if the pins are virtually next to each other, you know that it is two pins because the sensitivity is so much more on our former surface. So in the Sparsha Mudra, we are utilizing the former surface. Some people in the back, they say, can I turn it and use the back of the hand? No, you want to turn and use the palm because the former surface is where you have that sensitivity and the nerve endings that have reflexogenic feedback to different parts of the nervous system. Now, the second reason you use Parsha Mutra is to anchor your mind. Because if you say breathe into the front of the chest, nobody knows where to breathe. But if you put your hands there, your hands become an anchor for the mind to go and settle in that region. So, Sparsha Mutra is as an anchoring tool for the mind. Because if the mind doesn't go, the prana will not flow. Yato mana Tata prana, where the mind goes, the prana flows. So the hands are being placed there to enable the mind to go there so that then the prana will flow there. So this is how the sequence is there. And uh, again, it is not to be done mechanically. It has to be done with sensitivity. And uh, there's just so much in this tradition when it comes to pranayama that, uh, you know, we need many hours. But the aim of this is to just let people know all of this exists. Mm -hmm. That's all. It is just a opening of the box so that you see what's in the gift box. Later on, one gift by one gift can be opened up and then you can enjoy each gift one by one. But now it's just a picture of what's in the gift box. So thank you, uh, Nilachal and team uh, Live Holistic for putting this together. Thank you, everyone, for being part of it. Namaste. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful words of wisdom always sir. so from here sir uh, just uh, to bind up before i would like to invite uh, everyone on this saturday on i think it is visible with in the same lighting saturdays with uh, dr ananda sir where he will be sharing his uh, topic on the uh, who am i so all are cordially invited to that uh, <laughs> sentry lighting saturday also and uh, with uh, this, I would like to just uh, finish here uh, with the uh, Shanti part. So all are invited. Om Swasti Prajabhyam Paripalayantam Nyayena Margena Mahi Mahisha Go Brahmanebhyaha Shubhamastunetyam Lokaha samasta sukhino bhavantu Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha Sarve santu niramaya Sarve bhadrani pashantu Ma kashe dukha bhag bhavet Om shantehi 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 Thank you all. Thank you for being a part of this uh, uh, event and for the amazing session 
with uh, <laughs> Dr. Sangeeta, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank Anand, you. sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Live all Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Mamin. <laughs> Hi, Antonio. <laughs>